So I'm really, really excited to be bringing on um, a special guest speaker for you all today. Um, who's, uh, are we excited? Yes. Fabulous, right? Uh, super guest speaker today, someone that I interviewed uh, just a few months ago on the podcast. Um, I thought uh, his story was amazing, his accomplishments have been fantastic, and he really, really suits the subject matter that we've been speaking about today really, really well, um, because his background is very much in marketing, um, in building businesses in marketing, and, and created some amazing, amazing results. So our special guest today is uh, Dominic McGregor. If you haven't checked out the podcast yet that I recorded with him, you're going to want to go and check that out because it tells the entire story of uh, Dominic co-founding the company uh, Social Chain with his uh, business partner, Stephen Bartlett, that they built into a £300 million uh, valuation company and then took public and sold that company as well. Um, and between them as partners, they went on that journey together. And, and we'll, we'll probably hear a little bit about that story today as well, I'm sure of really building a business from the very, very beginning. Now, Dominic has now moved on to becoming a professional investor, and he has his business called um, Fearless uh, Ventures, where he builds businesses up, invests in businesses in order for them to grow, and he's got some huge experience in that area, and I'm really, really excited to talk to him today. So are we going to give him a big gold wel circle welcome, yes or no, team? So I wonder if we could stand for just a moment, please. And let's give our special guest for today, Dominic McGregor, a level 20 round of applause. Look at that, that was a wonderful welcome there, wasn't oh, it, Dominic? Yeah. Feeling good? Yeah, it was great, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I need to like perform or sing now or something. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous, well look. You know, thanks for joining us today. We had an amazing, uh, amazing chat on the podcast where we really got to know uh, a lot about your story, about the background of building uh, your business that you uh, built um, with Stephen and then really talked about your investment business as well. And I know that when we spoke at the back, you know, Dominic is using AI within his businesses and he actually, uh, I was showing him the slide, showing him what we've been talking about today, and he came up with a couple of things. He's like, oh, I'd like to share about this, I'd like to share about that. So it'd be really cool to hear a little bit about that. And actually, his philosophy around it was really, really cool as well. So I'm looking forward to that. But wh why don't we start off, give him a bit of background. Where did you start from, Dominic? What um, was the beginning of your venture into business? Because I know you started very small and went yep. on to do some big things. Yeah, and um, I, I always talk about this journey, how... I was never like the kid at school selling sweets. So I, it wasn't like in my DNA. I wasn't like hustling from a young age. Um, so it never really kind of came in my mind of like going into business or starting a company um, until I got to university when university is an incredible time in life because you have someone else paying the bills um, and you have plenty of time. You know, I think in second year university, I had four hours of lectures. So like, what else are you going to do? You know, you're going to try something and learn something. Um, and for me, that was social media. So this was in 2013, you know, literally 10 years ago this month, when I was at university, um, there was this thing called Twitter, which was starting to become quite popular. Um, and you could go on it and you could like see what Rihanna was doing, Justin Bieber and Stephen Fry. And I was like, this is so cool. Like, this is like the future. Um, and th at the time, it was like, you know, just Facebook had come around and, you know, we had MySpace and Bebo and, you know, social media was very much like not what it is today. And I was um, at university, and I went out one night and got ridiculously drunk. It was a <laughs> great night. Um, and the next morning, I woke up and went to the toilet and opened the door to the toilet, and there was no toilet paper. And instead of doing like the logical thing and like going downstairs to the shop and buying some more toilet paper, I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tweet about this because other people need to know that I've just run out of toilet paper. <laughs> so I started a Twitter account called Student Problems. Uh, and posted about having no toilet paper. And I got two retweets, one from me and one from a girl called Emily. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. Um, and then for, you know, I decided then to do more tweets about life that I realized at university, um, the problems you face. So things like realizing how expensive cheese is, for example. You know, I never realized how expensive it was until I went to university. Um, and all the other things that I kind of saw in my life through my student lens. And very quickly built that up to um, 20,000 followers just in my spare time. Um, but one of the kind of crazy things was that um, it took me 400 
tweets to get to 400 followers. And I always look back at that and think, what made me go back into Twitter on the 401st time and tweet to 400 people? Like, that's no one. That's relatively no one at all. But something in me was like, this could be something quite big, so I'm just going to turn up every single day and be consistently posting something. And um, we'll come on to AI in a little bit, but what um, ma made the major change from, to go from that 400 to, to, to 20,000 was Twitter changed. So Twitter was, when we first went onto it, it was 140 characters, and you can just post text. And then they introduced photos. And that was like seemingly so small, but actually completely changed the entire format of Twitter. Because now instead of just posting updates and having to be funny on 140 characters, you could post funny pictures. And when you think about how things are shared and how people communicate, you know, by much memes now, that was like the early inception of memes. So I started to post pictures that were funny with captions. And suddenly it started to have this virality where people were sharing it more and more often than just text. So I was in my mind thinking, I need to share more pictures, more rich media. So I did that and started posting more and more photos and that kind of extreme, um, extrapolated the growth up to 20,000 followers in the space of weeks while I was there doing 400 for 400 followers before. So um, that was like the very early stage. And then what I kind of realized is that, look, this is a bit potential here. You know, there's 20,000 followers here who are looking at what I'm doing every single day. And that's when I met Steve. So I put an email in my bio saying, if you want to reach students, email me here. And I got two emails that day. I got one from a guy in Birmingham, and I got one from Steve. And Steve was like, really like your page. Let me know if you want to make some money. And you know, <laughs> I can't afford toilet paper, all right? So I know. <laughs> I need some money. <laughs> and he literally put the pound signs in the email. So I was like, go on then. You know, this sounds like a good opportunity. So pick up the phone, call him, speak to him. And he tells me about this website he's got. So he has a website, which is like, Wal it was called Wallpark, which is basically a country for students. And he was like, I want to see if we can get students onto my website and I can pay you for it. And I was like, this sounds like good. You know, 100, 200 pounds at university makes a massive difference. So we decided to meet up, and he shows me through the website. I talk him through what I'm kind of thinking and doing. And at, by this point, Student Problems has got to 50,000 followers because it was just growing that quickly. And he said to me, um, why don't you drop out university and come and work together on building Wall Park? And um, I looked at him, and I went, I went, I was in the meeting, I was like, yeah, that sounds like a <laughs> really smart <laughs> thing to do. You know, let's sack off university and go and do this. So um, decided to do that, and he offered me £500 a month to come and join him. Um, and I said, yeah. I was like, yeah, okay. So together, we went and started building Wall Park. I spent my time building more and more social media communities. So got to the point where we had about 5 million students on social media. So from one page, from one tweet about toilet paper, we grew our audience to 5 million students. Um, and what we, unfortunately what happened is Wall Park didn't work. You know, we, didn't, we realized that students don't want to be connected. Um, in that way, when you're competing against people like Facebook and Facebook groups, it's very difficult with you know, little money compared to what they had. So we were kind of in this period of uncertainty where we had no idea what we were doing with our future. Um, and we said, okay, well, how about we try and turn these social, page, social pages into a business? And we were like, that sounds like we could do it. So we went on uh, PowerPoint, made a presentation, called it The Social Chain as in like a chain of social media pages, and sent out 300 emails to 300 people who were looking to reach students. And we got free replies. And um, we offered them a gold, silver, bronze package. And um, one went for the gold and two went for the silver. And the gold package was 1,000 pounds and the silver package was 750 pounds. So we thought we were making a killing. <laughs> <laughs> So much so that for some reason we decided to get on a plane and go to Thailand uh, and travel after doing those three deals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the logical thing to do. Right. Um, but that was really the, like, the basis of it. You know, we, we had these social media assets. We'd spent our time building social media pages. So when we went to speak to brands, we could walk into a room and say we were the experts of social media because look at what we've done. You know, we've built all these communities. So we doubled down on that as a business because you know we're, we're now in Thailand riding elephants and this is an amazing experience for us. We were like, let's try and turn this into something proper. So we came back from that and we spent the next six months really trying to figure out what the business model was, how we could scale it, what we needed to do to make it a success and um, started going in the kind of networking circles and meet, meeting people who were trying to reach students. That was the basis of it. Um, and then we met a, a business who offered us investment. They were one of our clients said, do you want to take some money on to scale this? 
and I was like, yeah, you know, this, this sounds like a really <laughs> good opportunity. Um, Steve was a little bit like, no, I'm not sure whether I want to take investment on. But I said to him, look, you know, there's not going to be many opportunities when we get to capitalize on what we've got. So, you know, these are all the things we can do with the money. So we outlined buying more communities. We, you know, we had the student space on lockdown, but we could go into the sports space, the gaming space, food space, fashion space, and we outlined like four acquisition targets in those areas, which were about 50K, you know, which we couldn't probably afford at the time. So we said, look, w this is what we can do, and we can tailor the model from students to other sectors and scale it this way. Um, and we said yes to the investment. So it was um, August 2014 where we decided that we're going to do the social chain thing full time. Um, we went out there and bought, acquired those pages we, we outlined, brought in a couple of full time team, um, and that was kind of rea the real day one. Um, but uh, you know, as most people see, they don't see the hard work of w which went in beforehand to get to that point where you know we've got five million students on social media. Saying yes is is a big thing. Yeah, yeah I've said, I've said yes too yeah. many times. Yeah. <laughs> My, my grandson asked me when I'm going back to university to finish it. <laughs> but saying yes, for sure, to opportunities when you, you, know, you said yes to the email mm -hmm. that you got from Stephen, which will tracks back a very profitable route, you know, uh, for sure. You said yes to the investor. You, know, you said yes to the meetings. You kept saying yes. You kept opening those doors. And, and from there... You then thought bigger as well. You went out, got the, got the proof of concept, which is what you know, we tell the people. We're all businesses that are growing, but you've got to get that proof of concept. So you went out, you sold probably before you were ready, <laughs> which is great. You know? yep. <laughs> and what say, happened with say those? Yes, say yes and figure it out afterwards. That, yeah. was the, that was the motto. <laughs> and what happened with those first three clients that you took on? How long, did they stay with you long? So one of them was called Pretty Little Thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> which was yeah. back in 2013, a really, really small business. Wow. So uh, they went on to be one of our biggest clients in social chain. Um, we stayed with them for a number of years, helped them kind of reinvent their entire social media outlook. That's amazing. Um, the other was a business called Hello You, which was a university subscription box, which um, surprisingly, actually, the founder then went on to copy social chain and try, oh, and, re and, try and replicate it. Yeah. Um, and the other was an agency called Seed, um, which was a student brand ambassador agency, which went on to be one of our um, long partners um, for many, many years, sending us a lot of work over a long period of time. So all three of them, two of them were very positive. One of them, we created our own competitor. Yeah, which, which happens, right? Yeah. Which happens, exactly. Yeah. So now you get to the stage where you're employing people and you're building this up. You know, what was it like if you didn't have the experience to go and run a business? How did you feel at that point? Did you have moments of stress, mm -hmm. overwhelm, struggles? What, what was it like in that early stages well, of trying to piece it together and figure it out? Yeah, I think, I think the most difficult part for, for me personally was that a year ago I was at university struggling to go up for a three o'clock lecture. <laughs> so like, <laughs> and that's true, yeah. yeah. The growth I had to go for as an individual from like, you know, having investment conversations to now managing people was like so, so intense, you know, especially at the age of like 19 at the time. <laughs> You know, you start seeing all your mates going out and you think that you're missing out on opportunities that they've, they've got and you're starting to, like, you know, feel like you're changing as a person because your priorities are different. So that period, was, you know, was very turbulent because, um, you know, once you get the enjoyment out of the way of, you know, ha been having to have the freedom and the autonomy to do what you want, and actually the responsibility comes in. Because at first it's novel, it's great, you know, you're hiring people, it's amazing. But when you start seeing that first person, like, buying a car and you ask them, you know, how long's the finance deal? And they go, oh, it's four years. You're thinking, oh my God, that person has just got a car because they're hired by us and we need to keep them in employment. So we need to keep the lights on. Those kind of things. And then you start seeing people get houses. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm like, this business cannot fail because these people have got houses now. So like uh, the, the, I think I kind of break it down to like zero to 20 was very fun. You know, zero to 20 people was really, really fun because it all felt like a family and like we're small enough that um, we can adapt and change. And you know, the, monthly pressures weren't that great. When you go from, when we went from like 20 to 50 and then 50 to 100, that was like the period of like massive uncertainty and like where like everything as a, as a founder kind of sits on you and, you know, burden, burdens you a little bit and you've got to make sure that your growth in you is quicker than the growth of the company so you can keep control of it rather than keep control of you. Mm. Amazing, really good advice there. So as you were growing, your first investor went on to be somewhat of a mentor, I believe, when we spoke on the podcast. And the first one, no. Oh, the second well, one, yes. The second one, right, yes. yeah. 
Um, so tell us about the first one then. What went wrong with that one? <laughs> <laughs> and the second one. Be great. Oh, God. So, um, yeah, chalk and cheese, really. So the first investor um, was a client who kind of offered us a deal structure where they would give us some money for the investment, but also sign us on a long-term retainer. So for us, we like that. It's guaranteeing the money. It's great. Um, but offered us no support or no advice. So um, they gave us like an accountant's number that they used and was like, speak to these guys and these will help you out. Um, but we didn't really know what we needed. You know, we were so young and naive that we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so, you know, we got to a point where like six months in, we hadn't done any management accounts. We didn't have any idea of the numbers. But we were, we were kind of thinking we're doing okay because the, the money's going up, you know, every single month. The money is like great. Mm. And then um, literally you know, one day in our office, we get a knock on the door. Um, and a, a guy, you know, you can tell he works for some kind of like HMRC, you know. <laughs> you can tell he's that, that kind of look a guy. And he comes in and is like, the founders, here, the directors here, I was like, yeah, I'm one of them. It's like, okay, I've got to show you that you owe a tax bill to HMRC. Look at it. I'm like, 75 grand. I'm like, what? And we had like no idea that when you pay people wages, then on the 17th, you've got to pay HMRC as well. We'd missed that for six months. And like, we're in the situation where like, oh my God, we, this guy's walked into our office and we've got to pay him tons of money. Mm. What the hell do we do? And we're like, we had, no one ever told us that. You know, so, um, that first investor was just completely hopeless. Second investor, basically, we met someone as we kind of started to get a bit of a bigger profile, and he came in, he brought out the first investor, and he said, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring your CFO in to the company to help me manage the side of the business that, you know, you guys who are 21 years old don't know. And I was like, that's fair, you know, because we understand, and we always knew that our value was that we understood social media better than anyone, and we could be proper experts in the product rather than having to worry about you know, cash flow and HMRC again. Um, so we brought in the CFO. So they really helped us in terms of thinking about um, the strategy of the company. So, you know, looking at us not as just a social media agency, but looking at us as a media business and yeah. thinking where actually we can create more value rather than just being a service business, which, um, you know, we found out has a lower multiple than a tech business or a media yeah. business. So all these kind of conversations and the kind of coaching mentorship that the second investors bought was priceless to us in terms of um, helping us achieve a bigger goal than what we set out to achieve. Yeah, which was amazing. So as you kept growing, you went on, where did you, where did you kind of fast forward to? You know, what size was the business? How many people did you have? What kind of assets in terms of the social media yep. assets had you created? Where were you at? And what was the kind of time period to get in there? Yeah, so we took the second investment in in 2015. So yeah. after a year of the first one, we cleared out the rest of the investors. So 2015 was kind of the, the time we got some serious money, I guess to say. And by the end of uh, 2018, so, you know, end of 2015 to 2018, so kind of, you know, two-year period, uh, we got to 250 people across the UK, US, Germany. Uh, we had about 80 million reach across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and we had been in a situation where uh, we never imagined, you know, in that three-year space of time. And what happened next was um, we had to face some big strategic questions. You know, we were at a point where um, business was very well known. The business was very fundamentally solid. And we asked ourselves, you know, what is the next step? You know, how do we go and achieve something which is some kind of exit or some kind of strategic um, move in the company? So at that point, we went on an acquisition spree uh, where we acquired um, a couple of other players. We looked at the business model and we thought, okay, we've got an agency business. We're fantastic at services. You know, we're growing um, businesses like Pretty Little Thing. Um, we're making their share price skyrocket by the work we're doing. Why don't we actually apply that to ourselves? You know, because we have the theory. We know how to do it. What we don't know is how to develop products, how to do the logistics and delivery. So if we could acquire someone who could do that, we could power it with our marketing and our media. So we went on an acquisition spree to find out a couple of businesses which we could do that for, um, as well as then ending up um, doing a, a public merger with a company called Lumaland, which was um, a business which had a number of brands, but also had the product development and fulfillment side of the business as well. So we effectively merged with that company at that point um, to create Social Chain AG, which is a public listed company, um, which was doing, um, I think, 180 million revenue when we uh, merged in 2019. Pretty amazing, right? What was that? <laughs> what was that? F definitely round of applause. What was that three year period like of going from, you know, not having many staff to just recruiting? hundreds of staff within the business. Yeah. And you were you were in charge of that aspect, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, yeah so th the first six months for me were hell. You know, I, I, I kind of really fell into a really dark place. You know, I started to use alcohol to medicate um, and really had a really bad impact on my mental health. And um, that was, you know, really, really turbulent for me. And I was kind of thinking, do I want to be here? What's causing my problems? 
And like I was drinking a lot. So like, you know, what starts off as like Thursday night drinks in the company turns into Wednesday night, turns into you drinking alone with a couple of bottles of wine on a Tuesday. And these were all, um, this for me was the medication of dealing with the stress, stress and the pressure yeah. of, of, you know, turning this from what was a bit of, you know, a bit of fun to real investors and real long-term kind of pressure. So those first months for me were absolute hell. Um, I had a very bad relationship at the time with someone who couldn't understand that work for me was priority. Um, and she was kind of gaslighting me to make sure that I was spending more time with her. And it was a really, really unhealthy situation. So um, I really, really t deteriorated to a point where I got to a, had to make a decision. Do I either stay in the business? Um, do, I, I ha do I have to stop drinking and become, become well? And what do I actually want in life? And even though all the work and the stresses that were being created were causing me to drink, it was also my answer was to the work because that was my purpose. So if I, you remove the purpose from me, I'd have just gone completely pointless in life and I've regretted everything. So I knew that the only answer for me was to stay at Social Chain, to get myself well, stop drinking, get myself in the best physical and mental health, health possible, and then tackle the big problems. So, um, What did you do to do that? How, what were sort of some of the steps you took? I think it's a good, you know, just yeah. to sort of say, because it's a, a great bit of advice for people that, you know, are suffering with stress or issues like that. Was there some certain steps that you took to turn that around? Yeah, the, f the first step is, is the hardest, it's acceptance. You know, you've got to say, maybe this isn't right for me, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe my amount of drinking yeah. is causing me a problem, you know, maybe I'm a not very nice person when I have a drink and maybe people are, n are not liking me because of who what I'm doing when I'm drunk. So that was the hardest part, is the acceptance that something needs to change. Yeah. You know, we, we all probably sit there and think, oh, I'm never drinking again, or I shouldn't have done that, or I shouldn't have done this. But actually to go out there and say it and then do it is, is much more difficult. So that was the first part. And then the second part there was um, identifying what are the problems, you know, alcohols and medicine that I was using, it wasn't actually causing my problems. Um, what is actually causing me the problems? It's the, you know, it's anxiety, it's um, the stress of the business, you know, it's looking at what in my day-to-day -day I was doing that I could actually give to somebody else. And I think that I really suffered as a founder who tried to kind of protect everything, you know, Did you? Not, let yeah. not let people in, not hire a management team, you know, be, have everything on my shoulders. And I thought that was what founders are supposed to do and leaders are supposed to do. But um, it was very clear that, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. Yeah. And I don't have, again, coming back to the point of our CFO, you know, we didn't have all the answers, but the more people we got in from a management perspective, the more senior leaders we got into the business to educate them about the company and like almost empower them to take it on as their own, shared the problems we were dealing with. So, you know, very simple one, people problems, you know. We had so many young people in the business, but they were always coming to us. And then to me, because Steve didn't want to deal with them, to me, <laughs> <laughs> about their problems. Um, so I was, holding a lot of kind of yeah. peop other people's emotional well-being. We never got a HR team part of the business and we never got anyone who was responsible for that. And we never wanted to share people in externally at the management team with the problems because we thought we could deal with them. But w you know, when you, have one, when you have 20 people, you have one or two problems. Yeah. When you have 100 people, you have 20 yeah. problems. So the problems spiraled and then, then they never got solved. That would create more problems and then that would be in the back of my mind thinking, oh my God, I've not done anything today. And then investors and all that other stuff would, 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 would yeah. catch up. So for me, it was looking at my day and looking at what I was doing and how I spend my time and making sure that I could have people that I could trust to do parts that I was taking on too much for. Um, and that was the transition, I guess, from founder to a COO in a company where yeah. you can't be everyone's best friend. You can't be getting involved in everything. You have to actually put structures in your plate, in your day, to help you achieve what you need to achieve because you start then getting the questions around internationalization. You get the questions around merchant and acquisitions. Who's going to do them? Well, it's going to have to be me, and I can't do the rest of the stuff that I'm doing if I've got to do that, and I'm only going to do that half as well if I'm spending my time over here. So it was mm -hmm. about looking at my day and clearing out the things that were causing me the problems, dealing with them quicker, or finding processes which, which could help them be dealt, dealt with without having me involved. It's, it's really interesting because it's, you went on a, a crash course in business pretty much, didn't you, in a very short period of time, right, at a very young mm -hmm. age. And it's very, I think, really open and honest and transparent of you to talk about how those those challenges affect you. I don't think we actually got to that on the podcast, but I find that really... We, we touched on it briefly, yeah. Briefly, yeah. yeah, briefly, yeah. Briefly, I yeah. thought it was, you know, really, really interesting. So so from there, you you eventually get this this exit from the business. Um, you take the company public, you know. Um, and and I've, I remember you distinctly saying that there wasn't a massive change for you at first, but... How's, how's your life changed since you exited that business? What does life look like for you now? And, you know, just to talk us through, you know, what that was like. What was it like to give up on, 
not give up because it's an exit, yeah. right, which is what you want in business, <laughs> right? But what was it, how did you feel when you actually were no longer a part of that business? Yeah, I think to your point on that crash course, that was the period I learned the most. You know, that, yeah. that you know, I, I always talk about it, it's like a little bit like a pebble going through a stream, it moves off eventually. And that's how I felt out what's happened to me during that period is that I became a much more well-rounded individual. And that was like the real, real, real growth period for me as an individual. And after that, I felt like, you know, unstoppable. I felt like I could go and achieve anything and, you know, taking the company public and doing that was just part of it. It was, it was much easier then. So I think that was the real, real growth period for me. And then that was just felt like a bit like a process. It felt like the battle and the struggles I went through at that point actually set us up for those achievements. Um, so I guess, you know, we started having the conversations around going public in 2018. Um, we completed the mergers in end of 2019. And then we had, I think, October 2019. And we had four months of it, five months of it until COVID. Mm -hmm. So it was a really weird situation where, for me, um, I was so connected to the business from a people perspective and emotional perspective um, that going in every single day was what I'd done for the last seven years. And then you, you lead to a shutdown where literally, you know, you can't see people, you can't, you know, you can't be involved. And what actually happened from a senior management perspective is that our influence in the business narrowed so much because we had then the inability to influence day to day because the teams are running that the management teams are running that and we could only then op operate on certain projects so we we really the business got so structured overnight because of the fact that you could only have a zoom call so if i was going to have a zoom call with someone on the team it would look so weird you know we, everyone remembers what it was like in march 2020 you know that weird co period i can't just pop on a zoom call with someone in the junior team and ask how things are going because i think they're getting fired <laughs> so, <laughs> so like it became a really lonely time for me because we i was working on um you know, we're looking at launching an LA office, we're launching, launching an Australia office, we're working on bringing some areas of the German business over to the UK, and all that was stopped. So there's like a period of time where I was like, you know, we went into firefighting mode, we went to try and look at, you know, assuring the businesses and the clients were okay. But after that was all okay, we kind of were at a point where, okay, well, why are we still here? You know, our shares are now liquid. We're spending time, sat, me and Steve were sat in a room during the first six, three months of COVID, like just talking about things like what are we doing? What, um, what are we going to get from being here longer? Um, so we we had some very open conversations around it, and it um, we were locked in for a year after the after the ex after the the listing, and um, it came to the window of triggering you know an, either a contract renewal or us exiting, and we just had an open conversation. Said we think it's time for us to go and do something else, um, and that I think the the. The difficult part for me with that was always going to be le leaving the routine, leaving the people, leaving the mission. Um, but for me, the COVID really um, Help broke, broke that. Yeah, 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 helped it, but broke, yeah. broke, broke the things I loved about it the most. Um, because like most people, you know, you can imagine at COVID, you know, we had tons of people who were at home and they could be doing any job for anyone, anywhere. It didn't really matter because we're all at home, watch, you know, doing, any, doing a w piece of work. So I, I was influenced by that and it definitely impacted me. So um, coming out then the other side and being like, okay, I'm ready to leave now um, and I've got other things I want to do in my life was a really kind of like um, freeing period because um, coming back to like, you know, not being the kid at school selling sweets, I had no, idea, no idea what my life was going to be like, but I fell into this social media thing. I fell into this business. I m made the opportunity what it was, but I knew now much more about myself and what I wanted to go and do. So it felt like a perfect opportunity to be like, okay, actually, I'm going to be true to myself and I'm going to take the opportunity to do what I want to do. What has that led you to doing now? So that's led me to launching the new business, Phyllis Adventures. Um, and, you know, you send that email to the board telling them you're resigning. Um, you know, you do the whole process of saying goodbye, the press releases, all that kind of stuff. And then it was a Monday we announced it. And then the Tuesday, all the team messaged, like, oh, my God, I'm, this is crazy, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, Wednesday, a couple more messages trickle through. You do the LinkedIn post. And then by Friday, no one's messaging you. <laughs> because, you, because you're useless to them now. They don't need you. And that was a really big shock for me. It's like, oh, God, you know, I was useful. Now I'm not useful. And no one, you know, but for two weeks, no one messaging me was incredible, honestly. <laughs> the phone was, like, put away. I spent some time with my, with my partner. We were, tr we were in Spain. It was incredible. And then um, you start getting the itchy feet. You start being like, well, questioning yourself because, you know, you're like, God, what have I done? Why have I done this? <laughs> and then I go, okay, actually, no. 
And it was the first time I asked myself what I want to be when I grow up. You know, it was that <laughs> first, like, what do I want to be? What do I want to be now? Who do I want to be? Um, and I really kind of analysed myself quite a lot and said, okay, what do I want my life to look like? Okay, what do I enjoy doing? And I really enjoyed the period of time at Social Chain when we were working directly with the founders on like solving their business problems, um, which was the, the you know the the best time of it. And what happened is you scale a company and you want to work with big corporates. You know, um, you know we were there with likes of Coca Cola, Amazon, all these you know big businesses. You actually end up you know having little impact on the business. You know, if we're working with Amazon, we're not going to move the needle for Amazon. We know we are a service provider for Amazon. Amazon could procure their work from five or ten other people. But in the, in the big thing, it's not going to change Amazon share price by how well we market Amazon Prime in the UK. Mm. It's not going to have a massive difference. So actually, the work you do becomes less meaningful. So I looked back at the early days when we were working with founders and helping them actually scale their businesses. And we were like, that's what I want to do. I want to spend my time working with entrepreneurs, working with people who run businesses, helping them solve their problems. And I want to do it in a way where everyone wins together. Because as an agency, you know, you turn up, you do an amazing work for someone, and you know, one of the founders of a big company brought us into the to his boardroom and said, "Look, when I started working, you, my share price was here. Now it's here. Mm. <laughs> Thank you." And uh, we got like paid like twenty grand for that. And <laughs> his market cap had like tripled into yeah. the millions, multiple yeah. millions. And it's like, you know, we provided a service there, but we took our fee. Fine, whatever. But there must be a model where you can all share in the upside. So started to look at the kind of venture capital space and be like, okay, what we should do, what I should do, and what Fearless should do is invest in companies, but alongside investing, provide the services they need to grow and work with founders on solving their problems where we can all have a success in the equity um, story growing together. So that was kind of what I did, but it really came from, a, yeah, asking myself the question, you know, who am I? Uh, what do I enjoy? How can I build a relationship with a company which is really healthy? And I think that's a, a really key thing is that um, the relationship associated was never healthy. The business, a number of times, felt like it was running me. And that would call that, you know, call that age, call that inexperience, but definitely felt like we were always building the plane as we went along. You know, it was never felt like we were actually were in a real control of it at any point um, until towards the end. So what I wanted to do was build something where there was always a lot more control in the company. There was always a lot more, less, you know, less pressures, you know, external shareholders had to be the right composition. Um, and we wanted to be able to think long term rather than short term on a, like a monthly sales by sales basis. And it, it sounds like an amazing model because you're putting capital into businesses, but also helping them grow the business with the services, which is pretty amazing. So um, we had a chat. I mean, some pre pretty cool story, right? Big round of applause, right? Um, we had a chat about and um, we spoke about AI and what we were talking about today. And you had some really interesting um, thoughts actually mm. on, on AI. Do you want to maybe just share a couple of things about maybe how you've used it in businesses that you've invested in, businesses that you've got, you know, or used it within your business, and maybe either the tools or there was a f you had a great philosophy around time, yep. which I think would be really good for, for, for everyone to hear, which I found to be uh, super pertinent and really interesting. I thought you were going to take it and use it yourself. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. So um, <laughs> we, we were chatting earlier and I was talking around um, social, social chain. And one of the things that we kind of defined was our kind of brand proposition. You know, agencies and service providers are all very, very similar, but how can you differentiate yourself in a market which is completely overflowing with individuals? So we decided to create the uh, mantra um, at the forefront of, pos of what's possible. And for us, that was very important because when we'd go into businesses and say, look, our responsibility is to keep you at the forefront of what's possible. Um, and that was on, on the basis that every single day we'd wake up and something would be different. You know, social media would have changed. Twitter might introduce a video or Facebook yeah. might introduce a new ad platform. And our responsibility was constantly to keep clients in the forefront of what's possible. So when, you know, early AI came out with and early tools came out with, for me, it was just the same, that same mantra, you know, that, that's instilled within, in me now is, always be at the forefront because for example when you went onto Facebook and you tried a new ad platform or a new ad set what they do is they would make you um, benefit from it to yeah. get you hooked yeah you know so when they try <laughs> new products you know they're like yeah. you get great returns so they go oh my god this works and you put my money into it yeah so we always knew that we always knew that the platforms were bringing out new features and those new features were going to be where you could have marginal gains so we just created this in within us. So when AI, AI came out and ChatGPT, you know, we were um, looking at it from a business now and saying, okay, what is the possibilities here? 
Um, and there's been a couple which I've kind of introduced which weren't on the list that you mentioned. But there's a really good one called latte, as in like a latte you drink. Um, it's a... They love lattes, they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a... Um, it's a video editing, AI video editing software, which you upload a uh, long video to, and it cuts you out social sni snippets. So you get like 10 clips of 30 seconds of that are in portrait mode that you can put straight on social media. So That's awesome. It's awesome. awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. So for me thinking about that, okay, you know, we have a team of video editors who are responsible for doing the subtitles, doing the social clips, and they were, you know, they were spending... I think I was saying to you, you know, two days a week editing this content to make it right for social, to make it right for the audio. And now that can be done in not 30 seconds, but maybe about a minute of yeah. them doing it. And then you just think about how um, that time could be re reused. And I think so some, some people are looking at this AI revolution as an opportunity to make redundancies. I don't think that's the case. I think that what we're looking at here has actually been applying people to higher, higher valued opportunities. So those two days a week of us making, making social assets weren't necessarily billed at the highest rate because it's quite mundane. It's, you know, the clients would ask for it, but it wouldn't be the kind of core reason why they came to us. So those two days now, which are replaced by one minute of AI, we can take those two people and apply them to higher value, higher charging, therefore more revenue and profit opportunities. So this whole AI thing for me is about saving time. As you said, everyone put their hand about saving time and then reallocating resources to more optimal areas where people can drive more money because it's saving tons of time. It's not wasting time, um, but it's, it, for me, it's an opportunity for people to get focusing on the areas that do matter: um, sales, you know, marketing, business development, growth, people, uh, and bring, bringing more possibility of profit into the company. Yeah, pretty amazing, and and, ch and that for sure. Uh, check that out on the the clipping, which is pretty incredible. Is there any, and and you were an early adopter, right, of of Twitter, as you mentioned, and then Facebook. And that early adoption, this is what I was explaining to everyone earlier on. You know, in my first business, I was a big early adopter of Facebook ads. Yep. Right? And the CPM was so low that we were able to just make a, the glory a days. shit ton of money, right? The glory days, you yeah. know. And, and like getting on the gravy train early, um, what would your thoughts be around that, you know, and, and how that applies to AI right now? Yeah, I think, you know, um, so we, as a business social chain, we, we launched TikTok in the UK. So, like, we saw TikTok come in, and, like, we were on it really, really early. We had audiences that got to a million, millions of followers before anyone had really ad adopted it. And that was our, kind of, like I said, the mantra is always been at the forefront. You know, TikTok, in, I think we did 20, 2018, we, we worked with it, you know, long before it kind of boomed. It was like, this is going to be the future. Um, and we made a huge amount of revenue from launching TikTok in the UK, US, but also then when, um, when we'd done that, we case studied it, it was phenomenal to go and say to other brands, look at what we've just done with TikTok, because everyone wanted TikTok. Everyone wanted to know who had got TikTok in the UK. So for us, being at that forefront and playing at the, the, the kind of edges of what's possible um, created so much opportunity to short, short term and long term. And I think AI now, um, you know, last year it was crypto and blockchain. Yeah. At the yeah. moment it's AI. It always changes, always yeah. evolves. And I think what you've got to understand is very, very quickly being able to analyze it, apply it to the business, understand where you can have value on it, and then look at what's next. Because yeah. always what's next is coming. Um, but what's interesting now is what, I've, what I think has happened a lot is that that window of opportunity has decreased mm -hmm. because we've democratized information so much more yeah. than back in 2013, 2014, 2015. So that, actually that window of Facebook CPMs, which yeah. was a fantastic window and went on for about six months or so, mm. has now declined because yeah. people will move faster. So I think it has to come from a culture of innovation, has to come from a culture of thinking about the future, looking at how you can apply things, and being able to quickly make decisions on products or, or areas of business and be like, no, actually, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not going to waste time on something that's not going to apply to me. Actually, I should focus my energy here. So um, I think it has to be led by the founder of constantly looking at ways to innovate and evolve what they're doing. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, look, um, we've got some time for some... Can we give Dominique a massive big round of applause? Some, some awesome stuff there. Um, we've got an opportunity to ask a, a few questions before we move into doing some photos. Have we got somebody that would like to ask a question about the journey, about anything that Dominic's been through, um, some of the experience in growing businesses? So Alia is going to go first. So stand up for us and give her a big round of applause. Hi. Well done. So in this current climate now, where does the CEO start? In terms of what? 
Well, you started <laughs> off with Twitter. Yeah, you, okay. you oh, right. put out one post, yep. and then 400 followers you got. In this current climate now, with all the AI and everything that's available, how do we start getting followers for our own accounts and our own businesses or business social accounts? Yeah, I think I think one of the most interesting debates I've kind of looked at over the last couple of years has been followers versus like, um, like, I guess followers in terms of like, and then like meaningful relationships. Okay, so followers is a really big number where you can know a lot of people, but not very well. Meaningful relations are the people you can know. You know, you could have five five, five contacts there, which are much more valuable than the five thousand on social media. So I am a big, big fan of newsletters at the moment. You know, looking at your sector, looking at your niche, and delivering value to people. Um, what I always looked at from what I was doing, you know, I was creating value in, a sense in the form of humor for students. It was funny, it was engaging, and I was building an audience that people cared about around that. What I do now is look at building audiences in high value areas around topics I'm interested in. So I talk around investing, I talk around uh, VC market, I talk around exits, I talk around culture and companies. And having less followers because the market's smaller, but a higher value and delivering them higher value content is where I would sp start now. So I think the, there's a huge, huge growth in newsletters. That's where I would be spending my attention and focus. Well, I was supposed to um, do my newsletter three months ago and I'm still doing it. You know, yeah. So now I'm Have going to definitely be on make it. Make sure you watch the video from this morning and <laughs> it won't take you three months, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so just one more. Um, oh. So are you looking to um, invest in a, a business now? Yeah, or is that what you're always oh. looking for? Yeah, yeah. No, I always look and speak to founders who are looking to raise capital. Oh, um, yeah. okay. Regardless if I'm the answer, I'll probably have someone that can help. Oh, so then we can have a conversation with you. We can have coffee. We can have coffee, yeah. Excellent. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so much. And how many uh, businesses have you invested in now, Dominic? Um, it, on the fearless, there's been 10. Yep. But across my kind of like angel network, I've done about 25 altogether. Nice. Um, so I tend to do things that are more tech-focused, higher, you know, more risk in the personal side of things. And the fearless model is looking at deploying capital and help at the same time. So uh, that tends to be a different type of business profile. Yeah, nice, great stuff. Okay, I have a question. So, Gazala, yeah. Hi, Dominic. Uh, so, basically, the qu one of the questions that Ali already asked was about, you know, you investing yep. in, in companies. Is there a particular criteria that you look for when you're when you're investing? I think you men mentioned something about high tech. Yeah, yeah. So, personal things, I look at very much, you know, deep tech, future. You know, what's solving big problem missions. With the fearless side, we tend to look at companies which are profitable, uh, which are needing support on scaling. Um, so it tends to be businesses which are around 500K to 1.5 million revenue, break even profitable and looking at help in scaling. Okay, so they're already on their way sort yeah. of there and then you're looking to, okay. Yeah. So you know when you actually got your investment, if you didn't actually get that initial invest investment, do you think you would have grown to the level that you did grow? Good question. Um, we definitely would have, I think for us what it was it accelerated the journey quite a lot. It gave us the opportunity to go out there and acquire some things that we were looking at doing. Um, and it also, what more importantly, I think it gave us a responsibility. You know, we were 20 year old lads, you know, we, we were traveling around the world doing whatever we wanted to do. But actually, having an investor for us was actually mentally more of a like, actually, you know, we need to build something now. So I think that for me was the, the biggest part over the cash was um, the actual focus on trying to help someone else return their money. You know, I'll never forget, you know, the, the investor brought, brought in and one of his friends who was an investor as well. And he um, literally had a little kid, about three months old. And I was like, oh my God, that three year old, that three month old, he, his, her dad's just put the money into this company when it could be put into a trust for her. So like, I feel accountable to them. So I think the accountability was a bigger thing than the money. And were I think you, so. Were you, were you profitable at that time? Yeah, yeah, we, so we were profitable. It was just me and Steve in our boxes so doing things. So it was about scaling yeah. for you, was it? It was about so scaling, yeah. yeah. I think you've got a really ethical way of um, looking at other people's money, right? Because not everybody looks at that. But if you do treat other people's money with that kind of level of respect, you ain't going to struggle to find investors because the way you're acting, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's really apparent that you seem really concerned about the responsibility. I think that's really, really good. And look, the thing is, whenever someone's going to invest in a company, you need to show them proof of concept, right? You need to show them, hey, I've got a model here that works you know, and I sell my products to this person and this is how it works and this is what it returns and if you invest, this is what you're going to get back. 
you know, even on a small scale, you're going to need to demonstrate that level of, um, in order to secure an investment, of course, right? Yep. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Other questions? Right. Who would, uh, yeah, so we go over to Julie. Yeah. Very serious question. What happened when you dropped out of uni? How did that go down with your family? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to know. Um, That's so a really interesting question. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess there's two kind of approaches to it. So, number one, it was like a half foot out the door because it was like a year out. So, I was like, I'm going to take a year out. This means there's going to be no risk, um, but it means I've got a timeline. You know, I've got to make the next kind of 12 months prove that I'm doing the right thing. And like my friends at university were like, you're so stupid, you know, dropping out of university. Because I, I was at Edinburgh University, so it's not like, you know, very prestigious, you know, all that kind of red, red brick stuff. Um, but I said to my parents, my parents were like, if you want to do it, do it. You know, they, they believed that I was making the right choice because I had more information than they had. So <laughs> I've... <laughs> you know, so um, they've al they always backed me. They always said, look, you'll do what you want to do and we're here for you if you ever need us. Um, so yeah, it was it was frictionless relatively, but basically it was a foot out the door saying I've got 12 months to prove it. By the end of that 12 months, um, we were in the, the investment discussions, so we kind of proved that this had some kind of legs and we should give it longer. And I think by the end of it, there it was like okay, actually you know now we've raised investment. It's gonna it's it's gonna be something, and you know I I always saw it no matter what happened in that year, I would learn more from it than being at university. So it was always framed in that way. Yeah, brilliant stuff. <laughs> okay, we might have time for just one more and then we're gonna do some photos. Any other last questions? We've got one over there from Mary, right? It was first hand up. So let's go to Mary, give a round of applause. Nice. I was just doing a bit of Googling on you, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just seeing the phenomenal success that you had with um, Stephen, I just wondered, uh, are there any thoughts in the future of ever doing a business project or a project at all of any sorts with, with me and him, yeah. Um, don't rule it out. He's a he's the best man at my wedding in three months' time. So you know he's, he's charged me quite a lot for that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Half a budget on that. Oh. Um, but yeah, you know we we speak every single day. Um, we do little things together. That's not not in the public all the time. And I think coming back to that point about you asked like what it's like when you leave. Um, you, you know, when you're 19, 20, you've got a very sing different look on the world than when you're 27, 28. And I think we, we both learned a lot about who we were and what we wanted to do. And, you know, it necessarily doesn't, it doesn't, probably doesn't mean that some of our ideas and opinions on business and world align. But also, I think the exciting part is that we've got to the point where we can stand on our own two feet together and we can do our own things and be our own people. And for me, that was like a big bit of success because, um, you know, we, everyone sees the world through different eyes and they want to do different things. So... Um, he's got some really big goals, I've got some really big goals, and if those two things coincide at some point, it'll be special. Yeah, good question, lovely. <laughs> okay, well look, I think it's been, um, you know, a, an amazing, uh, amazing interview. Really, really should inspire you um, in a big way, because look, you know, we, we all go through ups and downs, tough times, have to make big decisions, take leaps of faith, take those jumps, believe in ourselves, you know, and have to go and make decisions that go against the grain in order to create our success. I think Dominic has really demonstrated that throughout and has got a, a fantastic way of uh, you know, building businesses, now investing companies. Uh, we're going to take a chance now to do a photo.